Up in the Scottish borders, Derek Cox has a small budget, but big ideas on making the local population happier. If we're going to make a real impact here, well, we can't do it by dealing with a couple of hundred people. Uh, we really need to do it by dealing with 20,000 people. And that, for me, is the real challenge as to how we go about that. What he can't do is buy the hundreds of fully trained therapists he'd need. He hasn't got the money. So he's organising four-day CBT courses to be attended by volunteers. We're looking at the possibility that we might be using uh, more uh, lay people with brief training in order to do brief interventions with large numbers of people. There's a worry though, isn't there, about having amateur therapists roaming around trying to make people happy? What we've got to do is to uh, allow people the opportunity to get to their own solutions for their own happiness. Derek's mission, with some political backing, is to boost happiness by teaching people how to counter unhappiness. It's clearly more legitimate for government to reduce misery than to make people happier. It, it looks less frivolous, I think, as, uh, as an objective for policy. Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman wants the world to be a happier place. He argues reducing unhappiness should be a priority for politicians in the United States. Something like 15% of the overall time that people spend in our study is bad time unpleasant time. Now that gives you something to get your teeth into and if you manage to reduce that number you know from 15 percent to 14 percent you would be doing a great service to humankind. Despite their massively increased wealth and a constitution spelling out their right to pursue it, happiness levels in America are falling as depression levels are rising. Jimmy J. Money, so they say, can't buy your happiness, but that doesn't stop people trying to sell it to you. Here in America, happiness is now a billion dollar industry and Britain's not far behind. The Wellbeing Show in London attracts 10,000 people every year. The science of happiness has been embraced by business. Comfort and joy are commodities. A cruise company has seen a gap in the market too. They offer passengers a cheerful extra, laughter classes. Remember when we were teeny teeny and we were used to go on roundabouts? <laughs> People's initial reaction to the laughter gym is, what is that about? Is she completely out of her mind? And I say, well, actually, yes, sometimes I am completely out of my mind. But very quickly, once you start the exercises, start becoming part of the collective energy, you forget about any apprehension, you forget what you look like, and you start tapping into your child. And you play, and you have fun, and you develop your laughter. Are we ready? <laughs> How we start to move around? The happy industry is indeed laughing all the way to the bank. You know, there was a time when self-help books were all about how to get rich quick. Now, it's the meaning of life, how to find satisfaction, feeling good, happiness now. The author of that book is psychologist Robert Holden. Firms like Shell and British Telecom have hired Robert to make employees happier and more successful. Very Mark, good to see you. Good to see you Are too. you feeling happy today? Pretty good, thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> what are the keys, do you think, to recognising, as you say, the happiness within ourselves? 
we all want happiness, but we don't talk about it very much and we don't think about it very much. So the starting point, I think, is to actually think about happiness, talk about it and get clearer on what happiness really means for you. How do you open a banana? That's the first bit. Just what, whichever way you do it, do it. Psychobabble, the sceptics might say. But Robert's courses employ a lot of proven psychological techniques, including some of the ideas used in cognitive behavioural therapy. What I want you to think about is what is the best bit for you when it comes to eating a banana? Do you eat a banana only to get to the end of it? Unless you're happy with yourself, you won't really be happy with what you do. It starts on the inside. You have to be happy with yourself. That, that all sounds lovely, but, you know, the, there's a problem here, isn't there? That once we were told we had to be rich, then we were told we had to be rich and thin. And then people like you come along and say, you've got to be rich, you've got to be thin, and you've got to be happy. I mean, we're under a lot of pressure now to be happy, aren't we? To be quite honest, I think everybody should live their life the way they want to. Uh, if you reserve the right to be miserable, then be miserable, make a good job of it, and, you know, and do that. I really mean that. What evidence is there, though, that Dr. Holden's happy therapy actually works? Well, ten years ago, the BBC reported on early happiness research and filmed his project. And I'd like you to introduce yourself one by one to everybody in the room. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to share with them a bit of good news that you've had in the last week. Caroline Ponting was featured in the program. At the time, she was a full-time carer to her mother and had become lonely and deeply unhappy. I want to be a part of a part of the general public. I just want to be a part of, of somebody else again, part of everyday people, I'm not feeling shut away and isolated. Caroline? For eight weeks, she attended happiness classes. Her brain was measured for signs of improvement. At the end of the course, Caroline reported that she did indeed feel happier. I feel very, very happy. How, how much of a success for myself and how I feel about things. Mm. Um, I'm very happy, yeah. But did it last? I wanted to ask you about the QED programme, which I think is it's 10 years, I think, since uh, yeah. you first did that. Would Caroline say, do you think she'd still be getting the benefit now, or could it have worn off? Happiness is a little bit like going to the health club. Uh, you don't go to a health club once to get fit. You have to, I think, keep going in order to stay fit. Well, let's, let's find out how Caroline is 10 years on, because she's, she's here today. Would you recommend learning how to be happy to other people? Is it something you think would work for others? Well, it does work. You, d you just have to be yourself and you bring happiness often to people. I find where I live in North Yorkshire, people will often say, what, what makes you happy? And I just say, well, there's lots of things around me that make me happy. You know, try it. I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a bit of a prankster at times, and they laugh and they think that's great. You discovered your playfulness again. Yes, didn't you? yes, it's back to being the, the sort of the kittish, the kittenish, skittish yeah. sort of behaviour. Yeah, and I saw I that in you, and you we did, all did. did. We yeah. all saw that yes. in you, but it, I'm you, still playful. you mm. can forget mm. that. You know, to have fun in life, mm. and you just when you remembered, mm. you really remembered mm. again, mm. didn't you? And that hasn't stopped. No, it's gone on. The memory <laughs> is still there. Obviously, and I, and I still do. <laughs> Caroline's managed to find happiness and sustain it. For most of us, though, it's not that easy. Since the dawn of time, we've sought shortcuts to happiness. Early man got high on psychotropic drugs. Alcohol's been around since the Stone Age. The designer drugs of today promise ecstasy in a pill. We are getting ever closer to being able to manipulate happiness in the brain. What in the hell are you doing? I find this button the best. In the 60s, psychiatrist Bob Heath put an electrode in the pleasure zones of the brain. 
I think it's one of the I think it's somewhat of a sexy button. A push of a button triggered a wave of pure pleasure. <laughs> what are you laughing about? I don't know. Huh? Are you, are you doing something to me? But the pleasure stopped when the current was stopped, and Heath eventually abandoned his work. There's something slightly spooky about the idea that we, perhaps in, in the near future, might be able to stimulate our brain to make us feel wonderfully and supremely happy. Oh, I think that's very spooky. But I also think that that's probably not going to happen. Prospects of actually putting an electrode in and permanently changing people's happiness, and that is the state of contentment, over time. I think the only way that one can do that is by changing the circumstances that people are in. Robert Matthews, though, does have an electrode in his brain. And its purpose, in a sense, is to make him happier. He had a leg amputated after an accident. As sometimes happens, Robert still suffers excruciating pain from the leg that no longer exists. My lowest took me so low, um, it, it had gone, bef I couldn't even think about myself or my family or anything. That's how far I went. So happiness so, so, something completely So happiness had gone. The electrode being monitored here gives Robert deep brain stimulation when he turns a switch under his shirt. The pain reduces and he can experience happiness again used to worry about it, the fact of having something it in my head. Um, but now I don't look at it like that. I mean, it works to a percentage, which gives us a better way of life than what we had before. Your well-being is, is higher? It's higher. It's increased. It has. Let me ask you this. If they could change the setting on your, on your button, so that not only did it get rid of the pain, say all of the pain, mm. but it could actually make you feel positively happy, mm. would you turn it up to the happy level? Oh, definitely. Most definitely all the way. <laughs> Take it all the way. Yes. Yeah. It'd be a happy day, wouldn't it? But films and literature have regarded artificial happiness as sinister. In the 1930s, novelist Aldous Huxley wrote about it in his book Brave New World. The idea of synthetic emotion is also explored in The Matrix. It was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy. In our opinion poll, we asked whether people would take pills that made them happy if there were no side effects. Three out of four people said, no thanks. We do not want to create a society that's happy because of drugs, society that's locked into happiness. We still want people with functioning emotion systems, systems that react when bad things are happening and react when good things are happening. It seems to me that drugs as, as a solution to unhappiness are rather similar to kind of, you know, say, plastic surgery to enhance your beauty or whatever. The quick fix is potentially on the horizon, but I, I think it'll keep receding, as it already has. We were promised years ago that we would have the pharmacological solution to all of emotional problems. It hasn't happened. Perhaps the answer is talking. There's excitement that cognitive behavioral therapy, that breakthrough in psychology, could do amazing things for society's happiness. Potentially, it's got colossal implications. We could see a future where people did not suffer from severe anxiety and depression. I, I don't think that's putting it too strongly. I also think that in terms of everyday worries, we are in a position to give people the tools to deal with those that would then allow them to go forward and achieve the things which they want to achieve. It is an amazing thought. Science holds out the promise that it can make humankind happier. Our mental health our happiness improves our physical health and the quality of our lives. For the moment, though, politicians don't seem to regard it as a priority. Next week, if we want to be happy, we need friends, yet we're becoming more solitary. The answer? Less of this, but more of this. 
And for more on happiness, go to bbc.co.uk slash happinessformula. Formula.